morning. Thank you. You are out there. It's good to see everyone. Uh, Rupert just mentioned I was here four years ago as a participant in the Better Learning Conference. There's some familiar faces out in the audience, which is just lovely. And I feel so very honored to be here um, in a slightly different role uh, to talk to you about some things today that I hope are useful and, and um, maybe a little bit interesting also. Uh, I apologize. I don't have the gravitas of a British accent, but I'll do my best in my Minnesotan English. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do come from Minnesota originally. I've been living in Mexico for 19 years. My experience and background is in mostly Latin America, but I do lead programs around the world now. I've been participating with those programs for the last several years. So thank you for that. I was going to say thank you to all of you for being here today, but I realize you don't really have a choice because there's no other session going on. So <laughs> bear with me. I want to start by focusing a little bit about what this topic actually is. Okay, because technology is really kind of a buzzword out there, right? It's, it's exciting for some of us, it's really scary for some of us, it's really difficult to do in the right way. Or some, for some of us, it's really, really easy. Sometimes it doesn't work, we've seen that. Um, it can be really impressive and really impactful. But we're gonna be talking about how we use and integrate the technology into our institutions and classrooms, okay? And I think, one of the best ways to sort of present the ideas that we're going to talk about today is first to discuss what this presentation is not. Now, please don't leave when I explain this to you, because there might still be something interesting here for you after all, but this presentation is not a discussion of the new, uh, the most exciting pieces of technology that you can bring in your classroom. I am not going to be telling you the top 15 ways to teach vocabulary or, or, or songs with technology. I am not going to be over, going over specific pieces of software or hardware, et cetera. To be fair, I don't think a half an hour is enough time for us to do that in any meaningful way. I also think it needs to be personalized for your institution, for your teachers, for your students, for you, in fact. But what I am going to talk about is a little bit of a roadmap for how we can make those decisions surrounding technology in our institutions. All of you here are leaders, leaders in your classroom, leaders in your field, leaders in your institution, one way or another. And it's really important that we start thinking about how we work with the integration of technology and or any other sort of changes that we make to our program. This is something that's really important to me personally. It's where a large piece of my professional experience lies. It's what I love to do because I love the complexities of institutions and teachers and students. Um, and so I hope that there's some good takeaways for you here. Uh, I did, when I was thinking about setting up this presentation, I was concerned with several things. The first is I didn't want to bore you out of your minds. <laughs> I wanted to bring you something in 30 minutes that was interesting but also useful but perhaps could give you some takeaways and or at least pique your interest. And I thought that the best way to approach that might be to get some voices from the field. And so I put together a survey. I thought that I would send the survey out for several weeks. I actually closed it down after 24 hours because I had 231 participants in the survey. And in fact, some of you here might have participated in the survey because I sent it out through some of our partners at Cambridge. This is the population that responded to the survey. I went back in last week and I have over 300, even though I had closed it at the, well, I closed it, meaning I stopped looking at it. <laughs> I downloaded the report. I have over 300 respondents, which is really interesting. I'm gonna go back and take a look at it again. But about 15% of the respondents self named themselves as leaders in their institution, uh, perhaps by title or unofficial role in the institution or official role. So we have academic directors, language department heads, coordinators, directors. Um, we also have uh, the largest group was full or part-time teachers that were answering this survey. Um, and then where you see other, I mean, they're not aliens, they're just teachers that were doing things like full-time tutoring, online teaching, a different category than the one I had given in the choices. So just so you know, you're gonna hear from these voices during my presentation. I hope some of you are in here. Trust me, I read every single comment. Uh, and so, I asked questions. If you did participate in the survey, you would have noticed that my questions were structured quite similarly between them, okay? Meaning, I was 
asking questions that on the outset seemed sort of similar, which was really intentional. It's not because I'm bad at writing survey questions. Um, it was intentional because I was trying to tease out the ideas surrounding the implementation and management of technology. If anyone's interested, I can share that with you. I don't, there's no problem. Um, but when I asked those questions, and there were four that were trying to get at this idea of how we manage the integration of technology, whether it be in your institution or in your classroom, with your teachers, with the parents, with the stakeholders in the school. How many answers do you think I got out of 231 that were related to this idea, the integration of technology in the classroom or in the institution? 10. Ten. Anyone else? This is an easy question, guys. You can do this. Pick a number, 1 to 230. 80% of the respondents, pretty good guess. Anyone else? Well, this might not seem that important to you, but the real answer is I got zero. Zero. Four questions out of 12 that were directed specifically at how you manage integration of technology, and the responses had nothing to do with the question. And the reason for that is because when we think of technology, we think, oh my god, I use Kahoot in my classroom and my middle schoolers love it, right? Or look at the great new apps from Cambridge, which also, by the way, is extremely impressive and I need to look at that more. Look how exciting it is and the kids go crazy when they scan the books and that's what we think about with technology. And I want to encourage you today, along with me, to think a little bit or think, or, <laughs> discuss a little bit a framework for the integration of technology, okay? So that is where we are headed today. I've decided to call this a practitioner's guide to managing change, specifically when looking at technology in your institution. And I don't want to ignore the fact that we all come from the same fundamental beliefs or similar fundamental beliefs about English language teaching. Uh, someone told us yesterday that all of the teachers that they, uh, that responded to the survey, I can't remember the name of the survey, it was, it was Peter, I believe, that told us, uh, said that the reason they are teachers is because they want to make a difference, right? And we don't want to forget that when we look at our teaching practice, nor when we look at how we integrate new ideas into the institution or the classroom. So this is a practitioner's guide on how to do integration in our classroom. But before we do that, I don't know about you guys. You've been sitting here for a while. Some of us might be suffering with some jet lag. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> why don't you all do me a favor, please? Could you stand up just for a minute? Just stand up. I'd like you to all find a new place to sit, please. If you're in the front, head to the back. If you're in the middle, go to the side. Find a new place. Thank you very much. All right, so I want to, um, in this roadmap that we're going to be talking about today, I have three main areas. All right, and it sounds very simple because it is. I wanted to break this down as simply as possible, but we're gonna take a look at preparing for change, implementing change, and creating sustainable practice in the institutions after we've gone through the change process. All right, so when we look at preparing for change, does this look familiar to anyone? I don't know if you can read it. So, <laughs> I'm sure none of you can, I'm sure none of you can relate to this. Uh, you know, as leaders in the school, and I'm calling you leaders intentionally, even if you are a teacher, a part-time teacher, a support person in the, in the classroom, a coordinator, a director, an academic dean, a rector, whatever your role may be, you are leaders in the classroom, you are leaders in your institution, because you are the ones in front of the students, you know their needs, you know where you're headed, you're the one that creates the pathway from A to Z, right? Or probably W, because we never really get to Z. Uh, which makes you, by default, a leader when we look at changes that will lead to improvement in the institution, OK? And a bit of the problem is, we hear, how many of you work in primary education? Very nice. Secondary? I don't know what you call it in the UK. Middle school, I don't know what you call it. In the US, it's middle school. So teenagers, right, up through high school. University educators. So we've got a good mix of everybody. That's wonderful. I don't honestly know where it's worse. I've worked in all levels of education. You still get the parents. 
in your office. You still get the complaints. You still get them saying, but little Susie's friend who goes to the school down the road has a different piece of software in their classroom, and we want that here. Those are the kinds of questions that are coming up all the time in our institutions. Um, and yet, and yet, when it comes to the moment to lead the change, it can be really, really difficult to get someone who wants to be out in the front. Okay, and I want to provide a couple of tools for you uh, before I jump in. I asked you to change seats a few minutes ago. Did anyone pay any attention to what happened when I did that? Because what I heard up here was, mm. <laughs> <laughs> And it seems like you know, it's just a seat, guys. I mean, I shouldn't say that, right? Because if you work with, with high schoolers and you say, please change your seat, oof, oof. I mean, ser de Troya. Well, I mean, that's it. We forget it. You're in big trouble, right? So it seems like something really small, but is it really? I asked you to make a change. Now, something really important has been happening, happening over the last day and a bit. And I've seen it, and I know it's been orchestrated a bit, but it also happens sort of naturally. You have worked very, very hard to get to know people, right? To recognize faces that make you feel comfortable, to reach out within a professional development or best practice sharing community. And you probably came to the mediation session or went on your run this morning or went to breakfast and looked for somebody that you knew was a friendly face. And when you got here, you found the seat where you felt most comfortable. And I asked you to change it. Now, how did you feel when I do that? I know what your initial reaction was, because I heard it, right? Oh. <laughs> and partly it was because, do I really have to take all my stuff? Or I just sat here? Or maybe somebody thought, this one, this, this seat's the worst in the house, so this is a great opportunity. I don't know. Now, I was going to do this slightly different, but I didn't know the space when I put together the presentation, so I was going to ask you to move again, and the idea was to see how many of you went back to your original spots, because we always tend to go back to our comfort zone, no? So I see some people didn't really move. Maybe you couldn't. Some people didn't move very far. Some people moved all the way across the room. Some people asked questions, right? Some people just complained. I think we get a little bit of that with any kind of change we try to do in our institution, whether how big or how small we're looking at. Uh, but here's a good question. Did I give you any reason to think this change was important? No, no. except for the jet lag, which is real. Uh, there was really, I didn't, I didn't set the stage for you. I didn't get you involved in the decision. I didn't ask you to participate. You had no idea what I was doing. That was intentional. Uh, and what can this tell us also about our comfort zone when it comes to change? We've worked really, really hard for something. I mean, even if you're looking at a change in textbook, moving from one Cambridge University Press textbook to the other Cambridge University Press textbook, it can be really difficult to implement in your institutions because we get very comfortable with Touchstone. I <laughs> don't know why I'd use that as an example, or any of the series that you're working with. We get very comfortable with it. And asking a teacher to change, or even a student, can be really, really hard, right? So. Then we throw in the idea of technology, OK? And I don't know what it is that makes technology so much more difficult than other pieces of change that we try to look at at our institution. And I thought, maybe what I think doesn't matter, I'm going to ask the voices from the field. And this is really interesting. And I've come up with a list from these 230 responses. And if you participated, thank you. It took me probably three hours to read through all of them. People were very thorough in their answers. None of these answers were given just once, OK? And this is what I got. So the voices from the field tell us that technology helps to prepare students for future careers. It helps us to connect with students of all learning styles. Technology helps us to enhance the interactions with classmates and instructors in and outside of the classroom. It helps us develop digital citizenship skills. Now keep in mind, these are all English language professionals that participated in this survey. Excuse me. 
Technology helps students stay engaged. It helps us enhance the learning experience and create new opportunities in the classroom or beyond. It helps students access the most up-to-date information. It changes the role of the teacher in the classroom, becoming the encourager, the advisor, and the coach. Those were the three most common that I received. And finally, it helps students be more responsible. Now, I think we've heard over and over again when we talk about technology. Technology, like anything we integrate in the classroom, should be a tool. Well, that's a pretty powerful tool if you look at it. That's a lot of expectation on technology. I mean, who knew that Kahoot came to change the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> but this is what our parents think. This is what our students expect. At least that's what we think they expect, right? And if that weren't enough, I love this one. Technology transforms the entire learning experience. That's a lot of weight to carry around. Technology and integrating it can be really, really important. Now, if you throw another wrench into the mix, which is that technology changes by the minute, this can be really, really complex. Okay? So what I want to do is provide a template, a format, a model for you to think about as you go into the institution. My hope is that at this point, all of you are going to say, Ugh, obviously, because I know this already. I hope so. Uh, but I also hope you find something in here that, that will speak to you um, and that you can share with your colleagues and think about as you go back into your institutions and do this, which is a continual process, right? So before integration, we tend to step over, we, we tend to jump over some of the steps in the process, okay? We tend to think, well, this person came to my office this morning and showed me this new piece of software. It's not that expensive and it's really cool and it's really flashy and we could use this in the classroom. But is there a need for that technology? Do we need it? Are we getting it just to get it? Because it looks cool? Because it could be fun? We all want our classes to be fun, but is it contributing to the learning? Is there a need to upgrade or integrate a different, a new, a better technology in the classroom or not? And make a decision on what that technology should be. Is it a new software system? Is it a new hardware? Are you looking at apps? Do you want to look, bring in um, iPads for students into the classroom? What is it that you want to do? And does it or does it not fulfill that need? And this piece, I think, is really important. What I have seen is we forget to think about the academic curricular and administrative impact that these are going to have. And we forget to reach out to our stakeholders and involve them in the decision. So even though sometimes it's hard for us to recognize that we, in fact, are the leader and need to participate in leading the change and making the decisions, we do it without introducing the idea or involving our stakeholders, OK? Hopefully, you don't skip over this step, number two, collecting relevant data and information. Because I've seen all too often, and I get requests all the time, Lenise, we'd like some funding for. Lenise, we'd like your permission for. Lenise, we'd like you to bring us this. Oops. We'd like you to bring us that, with absolutely no justification of any kind of need whatsoever to bring that into the, into the institution. OK? Uh, speak to your audience. This sounds really, really obvious, but we are English language teaching professionals. We speak a very specific language about our profession. We need to learn to modify the way we speak to our school leaders. We need to learn to modify the way we speak to our teachers and to the parents of our students, and in fact, to our students themselves. And if we aren't being careful about those steps, then we won't create the buy-in we need to bring those stakers, stakeholders on board for the change. So when I say speak to your audience, I don't mean just go out there and, and give them you know, the 15 pages of research you did on the new LMS you want to bring into the classroom, but rather speak to them in a way that satisfies their needs. Right? What is it that the dean needs to know? What is it that the teacher needs to know? She probably doesn't need to know all the reporting features in, this, in the LMS. Your teachers probably need to know that. But maybe, maybe the parent needs to know that the student's going to have access 24 hours a day. So when they forget their homework on Sunday night, they can go on and do it. 
for example. Uh, use what I call a persuasive pyramid style. If you've ever said anything with journalism, this might sound familiar, but keep the most important information at the top and always modified for your audience, but always have all your information ready. If there's something you don't know, don't make it up when you're lobbying for change in your institution. It's okay to say, I'm not sure, let me get back to you. But hopefully you'll have done enough research that you'll have it with you. Always stay in touch with your stakeholders and maintain a positive level of communication even when you're told no. And I've seen this many times in institutions as well. A language director or a coordinator gets upset or angry, they've done all the groundwork, they've invested a whole bunch of time, and the leaders of the institution come back and say, sorry, not right now. It sucks, but it's all right. We can talk about it next month, right? I have unfortunately seen a lot of coordinators that can't get over the disappointment and the attitude changes and we get frustrated and we walk away thinking, well, then why am I even trying? We're trying because you're always looking for improvement and these questions come back all the time, okay? So implementing change, these kind of all run together. I'm gonna show you some tools, uh, some ideas at the very end that you can take home with you. Um, but this one I really liked. If you know anything about change management, it's really sort of an exciting field. It's not, it's not exclusive to English language teaching. In fact, it's not even originates in English language teaching. But there's this great mathematical equation, okay? The effectiveness of implementation of change is equal to the quality of the solution times the acceptance it receives from your stakeholders. And I'm gonna explain that a little bit. It's a pretty easy concept, but it's pretty powerful. So, quality of a solution. A solution now assumes that we have a problem, okay? Uh, but a, a problem can be defined just as simply as a need, responding to a need in the institution. Just because we don't use Kahoot doesn't mean we can't do fun and exciting things in the classroom, but perhaps there is a need originating from the learning that's happening or from the institutional goals that would dictate we do have a need for some new technology or some new innovation. Um, and again, this is sort of related to the idea I said earlier, just because something is shiny and new doesn't necessarily mean it solves the problem that we have in our institution or that it's gonna provide what we need, right? So I really like this cartoon. I see this all the time at work as well. I don't know if anyone can relate to that. And then here, acceptance. So we had, you'll remember, we had quality of the solution times acceptance. This is a demonstration of something called the J-curve. Has anyone ever seen this before? Yeah? This is highly simplistic, obviously, what I'm showing, but it's an interesting concept to read about if you have some time. This happens during any change process. I've modified it to represent the three stages that I'm looking at today or that I've broken the presentation in. And what it tells us is, you know, this is resistance to change. And this is what happens normally. We can expect this to happen, right, in any sort of um, change situation. Uh, you know, people before the change, we've got momentum going. We know what we're doing. We're comfortable. We like our seat. We don't want to move. During the change process, we might grumble about it a little bit. But then afterwards, hopefully over time, people are going to get on board with the change. Now, this happens even in the best uh, orchestrated situations of change because as humans we're just a bit resistant to change. You probably know that, right? Some of us are very resilient and love going through the change process, but not all of us. And so if you're leading a team and even with students, you know, they're get, they get comfortable with their tools as well. They might not want to learn a new LMS. They might not want to play with the iPad or <laughs> I wish, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> what we want to avoid is this, right? We want to get away from the overexcitement because then what happens, it's such a cool app and it looks so cool and then guess what? We showed it in the auditorium, it didn't work and everybody goes, oh, and then I give up and I don't wanna do it anymore, but maybe tomorrow we'll try again, but we're trying to look at a way to sort of normalize the change curve as much as possible during the process, okay? The reason this is important is because even if you do absolutely every step in the process and you've got everyone on board, you can expect it's not going to be always an easy transition. There's always going to be some bumps in the road when we look at changing anything that we do. Okay? 
During change, it's also really important to have a very clear communication plan. And this is something I find often goes unnoticed. We don't pay enough attention to it. We don't spend enough time doing it, right? Share what's happening during the change process, the good and the bad, right? Talk to your teachers about it. Talk to your institutional leaders about it. It's OK to admit you're having some trouble. It's OK. When, it, when the kid takes home the iPad and they can't get into the program, it gets a lot worse if we're not honest about, hey, parents, we've been having some trouble. Please bear with us. We're going to work out the bumps along the road. Uh, involve your key players and share responsibilities as well. You, though you are the leader, you have a team. Don't think you have to do absolutely everything on your own. And I know what you're thinking, some of you but I am alone, I don't have any support, I don't have any full-time teachers, but you have partners in crime in the teaching environment in your institution. Get them on board and let them help you during this process, okay? And do not take acceptance for granted because sometimes you might bring in, you might, you might receive a new piece of technology and try it out with your teachers and they seem excited about it. That doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna be excited to do it in their classroom because it's a big change. Okay. Finally, creating sustainable practice. Now, this is a little bit tricky when we talk about technology because, like I said, technology changes and therefore the need changes. Uh, but as much as possible, creating a, a smooth relationship to change within the institution, you know, setting the groundwork for your teachers, parents, students, academics, administrators, et cetera, to accept change as a constant in the, in the institution can lead to sustainable practice in a way that it wouldn't if we haven't set the groundwork for that. And this stage involves monitoring and sustaining the change environment within the institution. So you create a strong base of support and then you work together as you move forward. Now there are some things that I think are really obvious but sometimes get forgotten in the, in the process. Um, make sure everyone is on board. Even if they don't like what you're promoting you do with the technology, they still need to be on board, right? We don't want to have uh, Christian, I don't know where you are, there's several of you in here. I don't, want you, I don't want you going to me in the morning and saying, I love the new technology, I love using this in my class, and you go and close the door, forget it, guys, we're not doing that today. We don't want that happening. It happens, we don't want that happening, okay? So make sure everyone is on board, and even if they don't like it, give it their best try. Uh, ensure that you have relevant and necessary training, and this is a continual process, okay? Sustaining is continual. If you have to retrain every semester, then you do. If you have to set up a mentoring program for teachers who are more resistant to technology, then you do. If you're committed to the change that you're making, you take the steps to ensure that the training is necessary, that is necessary and relevant is given when it is necessary and relevant, whether that has to be done with frequency or not. Encourage early adopters to support the more cautious. So it was intentional wording, because I hear all the time in, in my context, well, that teacher is a little bit older, so he doesn't know how to use technology. Age has nothing to do with it. It's really hard, because if, if you ask me, I love chalk and, and green chalkboards. That's my favorite place to teach in. But technology is a need, and so I get on board, and I use it, and I enjoy it, even, at this stage, because we need, because we need it in the classroom, OK? Uh, and then, of course, maintaining everything. And this, it sounds really obvious, but can be so much more difficult than we, than we think when we walk into this idea of change. Making sure the tech side receive maintenance, but also making sure there's a process to learn from best practice. And the talk we just had with Bridget was a really nice segue to this idea, and I thank God, because I don't have to even talk about it. She told us about sustaining teacher practice, or best practice and, and professional development in our institutions. And finally, here's a, here's a quick checklist. This is just for you to take with you. Um, something to do, this is a continual cycle that needs to happen in the institution. I, I believe you're all gonna get these presentations, I think, so you'll have it. Um, and I think the last one is really important and sort of fun, but building on the success of the change. This is the one I think even the most careful leader forgets sometimes, okay? We forget that we really should be able to talk about what we've done that has been successful and build from that, okay? Your platform becomes much stronger when you've been able to prove that you've got people on board, that maybe 
the, the LMS that you chose this time wasn't the best, but the next time it'll be a better choice, for example. I talked about change manage management just briefly. So what I've done here is share with you, these are four of the most common models of change management. A lot of these are most of these. And in fact, if you do some research online, you'll find many, many more. These are four of the most well-known, usually focused on the business environment. I've broken them down into these three stages. And what you see in the boxes here are the actual stages of each model. But you can see they fit in here. So for those of you that are creating a plan, and I do encourage you, if you are going to lobby in your institution for any kind of change, whether it be with technology or not, take a look at a model that might support the way you want to do that implementation in the classroom. And some of these are really, really interesting models that are, that are actually quite easy to apply to our, to our learning situations. So I think I'm right on time, which is good. <laughs> We've talked a little bit today about preparing for change, implementing, implementing change, and creating sustainable change when we look at the integration of technology into the classroom. Now, I hope that you found something that you can relate to that is interesting for you. I heard some chuckling as I was talking. I think at least you have remembered some things you've seen in your institution. Um, my intention, like I said, was not to give you the latest technology to use for teaching vocabulary or speaking, although I'm happy to talk about what I know about those things, um, but rather to give you a framework to put into context when you look at your leadership and how you might sustain change in your institution. And I think that's it. Thank you very much.